A very warm welcome to you uh, this afternoon to this Carbu webinar on Syria. It's a great pleasure to see you all. Thank you for joining. It gives us a chance to look at uh, Syria, to discuss it at a time when perhaps it's fallen out of the news. Of course, there are other issues, the American elections, uh, COVID, uh, other great issues. But of course, it still remains one of the great political, economic, humanitarian crises in the world. The situation there is still extremely grave. And with a rampaging pandemic of COVID-19, massive bread queues, hike in food prices, fuel shortages, winter approaching. Uh, and of course, with the fighting, the clashes, the bombing still continuing, and the, well, literally hundreds of thousands of people still detained or disappeared. You know, Syria is still in this awful situation. So uh, it's absolutely wonderful to be able to welcome today Rania Abizaid uh, to a Kabu seminar. She's the author of two books on Syria, No Turning Back, Life, Loss and Hope in Wartime Syria, as well as her new one. Congratulations, uh, Sisters of the War. Now she's an award-winning author and journalist she spent a huge amount of time inside Syria covering the conflict firsthand, and that I think is extremely important and it's telling, and I'd highly recommend both books. She's speaking to us today uh, uh, from Beirut, so we're hoping that uh, the internet will hold out for us um, and we'll get a good clear connection for, for, for the remaining hour. You have the, uh, the details of the book, uh, and her biography, her distinguished career. So Rania, thank you so much for being with us. Um, so this is your second book and um, you've chosen to write it about two, uh, two families, two, two lots of sisters. What's the rationale for this approach and why did you approach it like this? Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you to all the participants today. I appreciate your time. So, this is a book for young adults. It's aimed at teenagers, uh, readers who are aged from about 12 to 17. And the truth is I never thought about writing for this demographic. The idea had just simply never crossed my mind. But sometime after the publication of my first book, No Turning Back, an editor at Scholastic asked me if I'd be interested in adapting part of that book for a young adult audience. And to be honest with you, my first inclination was to say no. Um, how could I tell a, this story? How could I explain Syria, a subject that many adults recoil from, to young people? But the more that I thought about it, the more I wanted to do it, because I think that it's very important to engage young people in global events, and especially something as important in Syria, which had, uh, you know, a, a conflict that had massive ramifications well beyond Syria's borders. And I thought back about a million years ago when I was a kid growing up in New Zealand and Australia, the daughter of Lebanese immigrants who watched from afar as their country tore itself apart in its own civil war. And I remembered how even as a kid, I was so hungry for news, for something that would explain uh, the news reports that I was seeing something that could provide me with more context of what, what was happening. Now, they were obviously very different days. There was no Twitter, there was no social media. Uh, these days we are flooded with information. We have been flooded with information from Syria uh, about what's happening there, but sifting through it and trying to discern the truth from the propaganda is a difficult task, even for professional journalists and analysts. So, I thought that a book like this might be an introduction for young readers to try and explain something of what happened in Syria, a place that they may have heard about in the news reports. Uh, so that was one thing to agree to do it. Then the question became, well, how am I going to do it? How am I going to tell this story without traumatizing young readers? And I I didn't want young, young people to turn away from what is difficult subject material. So I, I decided that if I was going to tell a story to young people, I wanted it to be a story about young people. 
uh, I wanted the protagonists to be about the same age as the readers. I wanted, uh, I didn't want readers to feel like they were being lectured to by an adult. And I wanted them to, young people to understand the broad outlines of, of this story through the lived experiences of other kids. So that even across countries, across languages, across religions, across politics, that there would be some element uh, that would be relatable to young uh, people wherever they might be reading this book. So I, uh, the other thing is that we don't often see or hear the perspective of children in conflict, uh, or we don't hear it often enough, in my opinion. So children are often presented as victims or as bystanders in an event in a moment in time, but what about the broader arc of their lived experience during conflict? Uh, I was interested in presenting that broader arc. I wanted to, uh, through the stories of these uh, two sets of sisters who I'll introduce in a second, I wanted to understand like, when did they first start to feel that something was happening in Syria? How did they come to know about what was happening in Syria? What did they see? What did they sense? When did it touch them? And how did they try and understand what was happening in their society, in their families, in their communities, to their, to their neighbors? Um, so the task was to adapt, no turning back. So in that book, I tell the stories of two families and I pulled those storylines out and I fleshed them out and I added what I hope is just enough context to understand what was happening in a broader sense. So the book, tells the story of two families, two sets of sisters. There is Hanin and Jawa, and they are in Damascus. And then there is Ruha and Ala, and they are in Sarakib in Idlib province. Um, the book is not a policy book. It doesn't attempt to explain every facet of what is a very complicated uh, conflict in Syria. It is a look at what families experienced over a decade and um, you know my hope was to explain something of what happened in Syria but beyond that I wanted young people who read this book to think about some of the things that drive people to leave their homes and to become refugees what it means to live through conflict what it feels like to have to leave home to go to a new place to be displaced to feel out of place um, so that maybe, you know, if there is a refugee child or an immigrant who is a new kid in class, that maybe they might have, have a deeper empathy or a deeper understanding or a deeper curiosity about what other young people around the world face and experience and have to live through. Rania, that's a very excellent introduction to it. And I, I would say, first of all, though, that it didn't read to me as a book that was only suitable for 12 to 17 year olds, although though it certainly is. I think it was a very powerful account uh, for anyone. And uh, I think that had lots of, of lessons in it. And I think it was accessible, uh, you know, in, in, in a way that some other books are, you know, a, a bit more of a struggle uh, to read. And I think I suppose if it right way to, to put this that in no, no uh, no turning back. It was more. There was more about fighting groups. There was more about people who were, uh, you know, involved in uh, Jabhat al-Nusra or the Free Syria Army or various uh, brigades, etc. Is that a, is that a fair reflection? Yes, absolutely. In in No Turning Back, I tried to tell the story of how a country unravelled by following certain threads and weaving them together to show you how, it, how the country fell apart. Um, and certainly the, the fighting groups were sadly a key part of the story, uh, that whether they were on, uh, you, you know, the, the, the myriad groups that were on the rebel side, including uh, Free Syrian Army battalions, Jabhat al-Nusra, peaceful protesters, other families. So it was, um, it was um, you know, and that also wasn't comprehensive. I mean, it's just really hard to uh, produce a commercial book uh, that a publisher will publish that tells you everything about Syria. I think that that is why we need more books on Syria. We need um, uh, to present the varied views from different perspectives, and it's very difficult to do that in one book. So, um, you know, and there are, there are a number of great books out there about Syria. So I encourage you to, to read as many as you can. 
um, to, to get that different perspective and to get uh, a broader sense of, of what the story is and what happened in Syria. Absolutely true. I heartily endorse that. And just to remind everybody, if you want to have, put down questions for Rania, please do enter them in the in the chat box and we'll try to get to them. Uh, I'm going to have a few more questions before we uh, turn over to you, the, the participants. I wanted actually, Rania, now to take you to the last chapter in, in your book, because the way that you do it is that uh, we're not really quite sure what you yourself um, witnessed or your relationship with the with the families, with these uh, sisters. Uh, I mean, it must have been when, when you read that last chapter, you you discover that uh, Rania has, has been there in many of the key moments and episodes, quite traumatic ones in certain cases. Um, what was it like, you know, crossing over that border from, you know, Turkey into Syria and seeing these events and establishing relations with these children? I mean, you know, uh, uh, who, who themselves were traumatized. It's very difficult. Covering Syria was, was very, very difficult. It was difficult to try and cover it from the government held uh, side because it was so difficult to get a press visa. And if you got a press visa, it was difficult, although not impossible, to operate independently in those parts of Syria. So that, as you know, Chris, forced many of us to focus on the rebel side and that involved being smuggled across borders into uh, pretty chaotic uh, areas where there were different rebel factions controlling different parts of a, of a village or a province or an area and those front lines and those uh, alliances, those power relationships were ever changing, ever shifting. So it was very difficult to, to, to um, maintain that sort of intelligence that you needed on the ground to operate as, as safely as you could in a very, in a very violent, very bloody uh, war. Um, so, you know, we as journalists faced all of the, the dangers that Syrians lived with every day, but we had the privilege of knowing that if we could cross that border, then, you know, we will find that whatever discomfort or danger we were in was temporary. It was only while we were on assignment, but this was reality for Syrians. This is how they lived. This is how they continue to live. This is how they have been living for a decade. So uh, it just doesn't compare to... to um, to what Syrians continue to live with. And, you know, we all did our best, uh, I know, for, for all my colleagues uh, who went into Syria to try and report this story, to convey as much of it as we could, as empathetically as we could, as rigorously as we could, because, you know, we, we need to uh, fact check things. And it was such a complicated uh, conflict to cover. It was um, heartbreaking to see children being operated on without an aesthetic, to see field hospitals uh, pop up because people couldn't get to regular hospitals because they were bombed, to see uh, entire families uprooted. I mean, there are kids in Syria who, the conflict is now almost a decade old. There are kids who've been born during that period who know nothing but war and deprivation and displacement. I mean, there are kids who, uh, don't know what it means to, to live safely in a home. There are kids who, whose entire existence is demarcated by the boundaries of a refugee camp. There are kids who have lost years of schooling in Syria. There are kids who don't flinch when they hear a war plane overhead or shelling because to them those sounds are normal and they don't know a time without those sounds. I mean, just let that that register for, for, for a moment. Uh, yeah, there are children who have witnessed the deaths of loved ones, and some of them are, are in this book, Sisters of the War, uh, or they have been maimed, or they have, have seen their relatives maimed. Uh, there are children who are have seen things that children shouldn't see, and they're living with those memories. So, you know, whatever we went through as journalists is nothing, it's, it's shameful to speak of. When, when we consider the, the continued lived reality for Syrian Syrians of all ages, but especially children. Absolutely true. And I've met a number of children myself in these things. And they, you know, for example, you do things like draw pictures and they draw pictures of uh, airplanes and tanks and bombs. And uh, the, uh, they don't draw the sort of pictures that my children would draw. I mean, I remember at one point you write about the Ruha, one of the 
uh, one of the sisters and she's turning 10 and she felt that uh, she was now too old to play uh, yes. uh, this transformation into adult and the way that uh, Ala and her sister collect sh shrapnel. It reminds me of my father telling me about how he used to collect uh, shrapnel during the Blitz and people used to connect, collect bits of Messerschmitt. Or, um, there was also a very, uh, I mean, painful moment really, I suppose, but it's been covered in the media at the time of that period of, of the hostages when mm -hmm. uh, Hanin uh, and her sister were, were, were captured. I mean, I think you yourself interviewed her afterwards, etc. I mean, uh, what was that like to be to be captured by these um, uh, groups and held for for a long time? Mm. I was actually with rebels in the Latakian countryside in the summer of 2013, when uh, more than a dozen Alawite villages were captured by a coalition of Islamist rebels. Uh, I was there within days uh, and it was a very ferocious fight and within a couple of weeks the regime had regained all of the villages but I knew that there were women and children who had been captured and I tried to see them and I couldn't at the time but I stuck with the story. I met the families of some of these detainees when they came to Beirut and I stayed in contact with them. I was also in contact with um, activists on both sides who were also working on this issue. And I kept asking to try and see the detainees. And in 2016, I managed to, to see them while they were in captivity and I saw Hanin there. And I spoke to her there then and I spoke to other women and children. And after they were released, I also sp spoke to them and spoke to the families and spoke to some of the activists who were involved in the release. And it was really, uh, you know, as. You're there as a journalist, but you're also a person. You're also a person and you're, you're talking to a kid. You know, I was talking to a, to a child who had been detained for, at that point she'd been de detained for several years. And I had um, talked to her father who was in Damascus, who was, as you can imagine, going crazy with worry because he hadn't heard uh, any news about his daughter and the other captives. And then I saw her there. And I approached her quietly and I said, Hanin, I know your father. He hasn't forgotten about you. And the, the, it was like a collective sigh from, from the women and, and the children that there was, that I, I was like a connection to, to, to their old lives, to their old world, to their families. And, um, and I passed on a, you know, I, I recorded Hanin. She had a message for her father, which is in the book. And I uh, passed on that message. Um, it, was, it was very painful to see a child in captivity, to see a child uh, held against her will and to know that she had been there for years. What can you, what, 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 what can you do? You know, I mean, there, there, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Yeah, and at the start of it all, uh, with the almost certain knowledge that she'd lost her mother and, and sister who'd been, who'd been killed. And yes. Uh, this is a Hanin came from an Alawi family. Uh, it was this deliberate to choose uh, an Alawi family from who were living in uh, Meze 86 in, in Damascus? So that, that was a deliberate decision of, of yours? I, I focused on two families that I say that they came to find themselves on opposite sides of the war. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were on opposite sides of the war, war um, you know, politically or actively involved. I mean, Hanin and her family were simply uh, spending time in their village of Bluta when they were kidnapped one night. Uh, I use the religion, but it's a, simply as a superficial marker. Um, if anything, readers of the book will see that all four girls are very similar in age and attitude and in, in their outlook. Um, and that this, that this uh, religious difference is, is, is simply superficial. Um, I also wanted to, to, to challenge this notion that if a family uh, stayed in their home and their home was in a government controlled area, for example, that necessarily meant that they supported the government. Or if a family stayed in their home and their home was in Idlib province, that they necessarily supported the current Islamist rulers of Idlib. That isn't the case. People, some people just simply didn't want to leave their homes. They didn't want to um, face the indignity of life in a refugee camp or, 
or the difficulty of life in exile. They just wanted to be at home. It didn't necessarily mean that they were actively supporting one side or, or the other in the war. And I and I hope that that comes through in the book. That that uh, you know all all uh, both families, all four girls suffer at the hands of Islamist uh, rebels. Uh, you know, Ruha's family is Sunni Muslim. Uh, her father was a protester, but his idea of revolution, his idea of change was very different from some of the groups that were in Idlib. But just because they stayed in their home doesn't mean that they support uh, the, rule, the, the ruling uh, rebel coalitions in Idlib. And I hope that that idea comes across in the book. I think it does very strongly and it's all the powerful, more powerful for it. Um, one of the things that strikes me though is that perhaps people had a perception of Alawis that they were somehow all behind the regime and Sunnis were all behind the opposition. These very, uh, you know, the way in which people tend to view some, some conflicts. Um, how, you know, uh, you, you were in Idlib in, in an area where much of the stories in the book were focused and you saw these varying opposition groups. I mean, how, how do you feel about the the media coverage internationally of these uh, different groups, because that again has sometimes been a little bit too simplistic, or am I wrong? No, I mean, you know, the, the media is a big word. We're, we're, we're a spectrum yes. of organizations <laughs> and groups. And, and uh, so I don't like to say the media, you can point to certain uh, reports, for example, at a particular time. But the, the first thing I wanna say is that it was really, really hard to cover Syria. It was, uh, access was very difficult, as I said at the outset. So access was an issue, safety was an issue. It wasn't like, for example, uh, covering the Iraq war. It wasn't like Baghdad, where media organizations had um, uh, bureaus in, in uh, Iraq post-2003. Apart from a few wires and what have you in Damascus, I mean, the, the, there were no foreign bureaus in the rebel-held parts of Syria. So uh, logistically, it was very difficult to operate, and many um, people relied on this flood of social media posts that uh, I mentioned earlier to try and piece together what was happening on the ground, and that's a very difficult thing to do. It is very hard to verify information by remote control. It's also very hard to do so in a uh, conflict when a lot of people are using pseudonyms um, because they fear for their safety. So there were many, many challenges in covering uh, Syria. The other thing is, is that even if you're on the ground in these, uh, in, in a town, for example, I mean, uh, the, the, the rebel splinter groups that, that would suddenly pop up and that would suddenly form, um, it was very hard to keep track of all of these groups and to know who was who and who controlled what road and any information that you may have had this week might be very different next week. So um, that in itself was almost a full-time job just to try and um, have a firm understanding of what's happening on the ground. So I think, you know, we have to, we have to be a little bit easy on, uh, on some of the media coverage, but having said that it is of course, you know, not, um, uh, you know, there, there may have been some generalizations about good guys and bad guys and things like this, which just simply doesn't play out in real life. I mean, real life is not a Hollywood script. It's more complicated. It's, it's messier. It's more nuanced. And it's our job to try and uh, pick out the nuance and to convey that to a wider audience. And, and, and you've done that very well. And, you know, you are, uh, and many of your colleagues did, uh, did as well. There's no question about that. Um, I want to now take you perhaps a little bit more politically and you know here, here we are we're on the cusp of almost um, a decade of uh, this crisis in Syria and you were there back in 2011 when all of these protests started out in very differing days. When you reflect on that right now did you imagine that it would come to this? I mean you, you know what sort of uh, were the things and elements of events that have happened since that have uh, surprised you? If you're taking me back to another lifetime, 2011 is, is another lifetime ago. Uh, it, it was just, I, I guess I was surprised by the, the viciousness, by the use of warplanes against people, by chemical weapons, by the rise of Islamic State uh, and how quickly it spread its tentacles around the world. Um, I did focus on Syria, however. I mean, I, you know, I was covering, I covered uh, Tunisia, I covered Egypt, 
Uh, and then I made my way over to Syria because I knew that whatever was going to happen in Syria was going to have very broad ramifications. If the regime fell, it was a really big deal. And if it didn't, whatever it did to cling to power was going to be uh, brutal. We knew that from history. We knew that from Hama 82. We knew that from the Kurdish uh, uh, rebellion in 2004. So whatever happened, and it was going to um, have ripple effects beyond Syria's border, given Syria's position in the re so-called resistance axis, linking it to Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas. And so it was going to be important. Um, but no, I mean, I'd be lying if I said that, uh, I, you know, I thought that the Syrian war would still be continuing a decade on and that we wouldn't even know how many people have been killed in this conflict, that we don't even know how many people are missing, some presumed dead, others maybe still in dungeons somewhere, um, and that there would be millions of Syrians either displaced internally within the country's borders or living as refugees. One thing that I think shocks me when I look back as we've got to a situation where we've had so many NATO countries flying planes over Syria, Russian planes over Syria. We've had fighters from all across the world from God knows how many countries. It's yeah. extraordinary the way that it's sucked in other countries. So when we sort of look back and reflect and we're about to have a new American administration, what do you feel might've been the biggest mistakes the, the international community made in all of this? You know, I don't know. It's not it's not for me to say. I'm not a partisan activist. I'm a journalist. And I think that that is something that I would like to hear from Syrians. It is mm -hmm. their right to point out the mistakes uh, that may have happened in, in and their perception of what should have happened. Certainly not mine. Um, but, you know, as the new administration comes to power, it faces a number of issues. Uh, one of which, for example, is the fact that Syrians who survived the war are now living under sanctions. Uh, the, 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 the many thousands who are, uh, you know, there are human rights issues. There is uh, the right to information about loved ones, about people who are missing, about uh, whether they're presumed dead or if they're detained. Um, there's a question of accountability. Uh, within Syria and also internationally for uh, alleged war crimes. So that, you know, and then there's also the issue of what to do with, uh, and this extends beyond Syria, with the so-called uh, Islamic State families, um, you know, in, in, in Syria and Iraq. Well, what to do with these, with these uh, people? Um, some of, some of them are uh, guilty of being Islamic State fighters, others may not be. I mean, how to deal with this massive issue, how to prevent these marginalized people from becoming uh, more radicalized. Uh, so so there, are, there are many, many uh, issues that are still tied to, to Syria and that extend beyond the country's borders. Big questions that the next administration uh, will have to or, or may not have to address, who knows, but they're certainly on the table. And if I may, could I... Um, take you a little bit uh, uh, to Lebanon as well, and because Lebanon is also, uh, you're in Beirut at the moment, and obviously major events, uh, you know, particularly over the last year, and Lebanon itself uh, has been hit by, by the crisis. How do you see uh, that at the moment? And, and has, has the crisis that, that has hit Lebanon in quite such a stark way uh, impacted even further that perhaps the views towards Syrian refugees in, in, in Lebanon, uh, you know, because it obviously hosts so many and for so long. Uh, how do you see it now? Well, uh, first of all, which crisis? Because we, we, we don't have the luxury of just one crisis. We have, in the past year, we've had a f financial collapse. Our money is locked in our bank accounts. We can't access it. The currency has massively depreciated. Uh, we have had political unrest, uh, civil unrest. We have had, of course, the massive August 4th explosion. We currently don't have a government. Uh, there is political deadlock and um, the state's coffers are running low and we may soon lose subsidies on basic food items and fuel. So it's, they're grim days here in Lebanon. And uh, according to many reports, uh, more than half 
of the population is now living in poverty. That's the Lebanese population. It's superimposed on top of that about a million Syrian refugees, whether they're registered or uh, unregistered in a country of about four and a half million. And you can begin to understand some of the massive challenges that Lebanon is facing at the moment. And, uh, you know, certainly some, uh, some people are scapegoating the refugees. Uh, that, that, that happens, that has been happening, um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a very sad fact. But um, they're, they're very, very difficult days for Lebanon at the moment. Well, our, our solidarity with you, and really we cannot uh, wish uh, an exit from these crises um, that, that you described. Uh, you know, we hope that Britain will play its role in, in helping Lebanon in a, in a constructive way. Let's turn to some questions now, if we may, and um, bring in some of our participants. Um, please do add to the chat, everybody. Now we've got Jonathan Fryer has a question for you, Rania. Jonathan? Yes, I was interested to know, Rania, if you've yet had any feedback from young readers uh, to your new book, and if so, what has that feedback been? Well, I don't have children myself, but I have teenage nieces. And I actually wrote the book with my teenage nieces in mind. Um, one of the big things uh, that I was worried about was that I might traumatize kids. Um, so I wrote a book with my nieces in mind and I didn't just write a book that I would allow them to read. I wrote a book that I wanted them to read. And I don't know, they might just be kind because I'm their auntie or something, but they gave me the thumbs up. And um, I have heard from some other uh, teachers actually who, who wrote to me and told me that their students had read the book and that they appreciated it. So, you know, I, I, um, I hope that's uh, more broadly reflective. Although, like I said, it might just be that my nieces are biased. <laughs> Well, we at Carbo, we give talks at schools, and uh, one thing we shall certainly do is recommend the book, you know, for, for that age group as, as something to read to, to, to spread the word. Um, now, can we have a... Bernie Howley has a question. Hi, Bernie. Hi there. Um, thank you very much. Really interesting to hear you talk about your writing and about the situation. I wondered when you were talking to the, the family and the, the, the children, um, or the families and the children, did you find that because of the chaos and that, as you said, that inability to work out who was who was who and what was what, and there must have been stuff coming from the heavens, from the roadside, everything, and to know who to who to trust, whether they could trust other people, whether they then lost their ability to trust their own judgment, which I think is really important when people are recounting their stories. And then also the matter of trusting you with their stories. Did you did you feel that their experiences had really cracked their ability to trust? Mm. No, that's an interesting question. Um, for many of the, the events in the book, they weren't retelling me what happened. I was there for them. Mm. Um, so so there is that element of that. You know, I was physically present when when some of these things were happening. And for the things that I wasn't there for, because I had been physically present or in contact, then there was that element of trust. And I never take that for granted in any of my reporting. It is always a privilege to be trusted with somebody's story and to then verify the truth of it. And it is something that um, I cherish because, you know, we often, we as journalists often are with people on some of the worst days of their lives. And uh, I mean, just imagine yourself if, if, if your, God forbid, uh, home was being attacked. And then here's this journalist with a notepad and pen asking for your time and for your thoughts. And, and that's a big deal. That's a big thing. That is not something to be taken lightly, and I never take it lightly. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sara Mazei. Sara, are you there? Uh, yes. Hi. Um, I, I would like to know if uh, Rania have uh, never met children uh, who have attended uh, ISIS uh, school and uh, what they tell about this uh, experience. Thank you. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear the question. He was asking if you've met children who've attended an ISIS school and what they no. say about such institutions. No, no, I have not. Right. Did you see, um, though, you know, some of the more Islamist groups trying to affect uh, the education and schools in, in the areas you, you were in? Yes, definitely. And that's actually in 
in Sisters of the War, it's in the book, you see Ruha and Ala uh, complaining about some of the new restrictions in their schools, some of the dress codes that the Islamists were trying to impose on their schools. Um, so that was definitely something that, uh, that, that touched the girls in the book. Yeah. And you also said there was a time, of course, uh, uh, when uh, they went to, to Turkey and they had to go to, to a school in Turkey and, and, and learning Turkish. Uh, how, how did they react to that? That must have been acutely challenging for them. I mean, just put, put yourself in their shoes for, for a minute. Imagine that you've, you've been cleaved from home. And what that means, especially in a place like Syria, where home is not an address, it's an identity. It is your history. It is where your roots are deepest. And it doesn't matter where in the world you end up, you will always be identified with your village, your town, your city. So to be, to be cleaved from that is, is a break with um, your identity and a break with your history. And it's very traumatic. And it's why being uprooting, uh, excuse me, why being uprooted is such a deeply traumatic event. Now imagine that happening to kids. And imagine that they had to leave their, their grandmother, their aunts, uh, the only home that they've known, their school friends, their extended family, and to come to another country to try and learn a language, to know that they're the other. When they were in Sarakib in their hometown, everybody knew who they were. And now suddenly they're the outsiders, they're the foreigners, and superimpose on top of that, uh, all of the ugly stereotypes about immigrants and refugees. And now, imagine experiencing that as a child. Sarakib is a, a, a town in Idlib province, it's actually on the juncture of the, the major roads in, in Syria and it's where one of the families was, was living and uh, certainly has been because of that strategic point, uh, uh, a flashpoint, I think probably more than a flashpoint in, in, in the war. Um, we got a question for you from Nabila Al Mullah, Nabila. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Rania. Being Lebanese, I wonder if the uh, civil war in Lebanon was a lingering thought with you when you went to see and interview these children in Syria. As you were talking about them, I couldn't help by going not even to, to neighboring Lebanon, but also to think of the children in Yemen, the children in mm -hmm. Afghanistan probably they have the same kind of a reflex a reaction to what is happening about them. I wish that UNICEF will embrace you and to ask other writers to put in stories like that. So it will be uh, an indicator for all of the youngsters to see that you know, suffering is not a particular thing only of Syria, although I feel with them quite a lot and I, I, it, 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 it is so touching. I want to know more about the youngsters that have been uprooted, the two girls, if I can transform them to Germany and to know what is their story also. Hmm. You know, I think it's, a, so, you know it's, a, it's a big question that is involving youngsters all over the world. But I think this is in the right track. And I think being addressed, to youngsters it should be made available to all uh, all over the, uh, the world. And I'm, I would like very much like mm. you, I would like to uh, bring it to the attention of my younger relatives. Thank you very much for your effort. Thank and you. Thank you, very you have much. a question, Nabila? You, you put a question in the chat about, um, Rania, whether you were affected by your own experiences during the civil war in Lebanon, whether that resonated yeah. for you. Um, I, I, as I said, I was uh, born in New Zealand and I grew up in New Zealand and Australia, but we came to Beirut for family vacations during the war, uh, which sounds odd, but that's another lesson that I learned about civil conflicts is that they happen in pockets. Uh, they don't necessarily engulf the entire country at the same time. And they were very important lessons for me to learn as a child. It was the first time that I really saw um, conflict. And I saw it at a distance. I remember seeing red tracer bullets light up the night sky. And my uncle's telling me that they were fireworks. I remember the sound of shelling and also being told that it was fireworks. And, and more importantly than that, I learned that the news isn't just some abstract political theory 
It isn't just people talking in the evening, but that the information conveyed in those news reports meant the difference between whether or not my grandparents were safe. And I learned to, to, I mean, I think that's why I'm a journalist, frankly, um, because I, I learned the value of news and information and, uh, and I carry that with me on all of my assignments. So yes, it did affect me, I suppose, hopefully in a good way. Understandably. And uh, yeah, we have a question from a fellow author on, on, on Syria, Diana Dark. Uh, it's got a, uh, Diana, did you have a question still? Uh, well, really, it was more of a comment. Uh, I, I just want to thank Rania for, for writing books like this, because I couldn't agree more that, you know, more and more books need to come out in on Syria from people who really understand it, uh, who can who can get through this impenetrable fog of, of the disinformation war, um, because it's become so difficult for people to really see what's going on. And um, as well as your books, I wanted to draw attention to a, a BBC Radio 4 series that's running at the moment called May Day, which is available anywhere in the world, by the way. The podcast is, you can download it from BBC Sounds. And it really helps you to get into the complete complexity of, of you know, the war through one person's story, through, through the disinformation uh, war against the white helmets. And it helps people to understand just what Russia is up to <laughs> in all of this. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of you know, s some British academics have been sucked into this. Uh, and, and again, this is the sort of thing that needs to be highlighted and challenged because, uh, you know, and so it's great that people like you can, you know, bring, bring a young audience into it too. So I just wanted to thank you. Thank you, Diana. And thank you for all of your work on Syria and for your books. Did you have any um, encounters with the White Helmets, uh, Aranya, in, 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 when you were on assignment? Yeah, I mean, I would see them rushing into danger as buildings collapsed and trying to pull people out of the rubble. Um, that was the extent of my uh, interaction with the White Helmets. Yeah, I mean, you'd see them doing their job. Yeah. Well, we now, um, we've got a uh, question from uh, Henry Hogger. Um, Henry, are you there? Hi, yes, I am. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Rania, for fascinating um, and very insightful uh, talk and to look forward to reading your book. Um, I just wanted quickly to take you back to what you said about um, views on the role of the international community. And I was very impressed that you made the point that it's for Syrians to, to, to make that comment rather than outsiders or, or journalists or other observers. Um, I wondered, though, I mean, <clears throat> on the adult level, I've heard from reports uh, quite a lot of pretty negative comment, really, from uh, from Syrians, Syrian adults, that is, about, uh, well, it's either, um, why don't you do something to help us, or, you know, why are you interfering, depending on the point of view of the speaker. I wondered if you had any reflection of that kind of comment from the children themselves that you talked to and interviewed. Do they, do they have a view about whether um, what the, the, the outside world is doing either to help them or, or, or to make their lives more difficult or uh, do they not really have, the, as it were, the maturity to, to, to make judgments on that? Well, I can, only, I can only speak about the children that I came into contact with in my years covering Syria. And for them, they had much more parochial concerns. They were more concerned about what was happening in their home to their families in their neighborhood. And they, uh, on the rebel side at least, more often pointed the finger at Assad. Um, and actually sometimes Russia and Iran behind him. You know, the, the, kids, the kids hear the conversations. They're in the room. They're um, present. They're trying to understand it as well. So it's not as if these things are completely foreign to them. And that's um, another reason, actually, why I wanted the protagonists to be kids themselves. So you can see how they're trying to process what's happening to them. But um, more often, based on my experience, it was it was more, uh, you know, that they had more localized concerns, and uh, you know, they could point to more local enemies, if you like, uh, to to try and understand their predicament. Um, we have a question from Amber Yusuf. Amber. Hello, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for giving this talk. Um, I think it's really important like that we have things like this um, because there are a lot of young people out there, young meaning teenage, young meaning young adults, 
um, like at university. And I think sometimes we, we come across like issues like this and we feel really like passionate about it, but we have all this passion and we don't know what to do with it. And we mm. feel like we're really powerless in the grand scheme of things, you know? Um, and we just wonder like, what, what can we actually do to make a difference in the world's perception of Syria, Lebanon, you know, any kind of country that has gone through war and, you know, like how can we change the world's perception of refugees? Do you, do you have any advice for young people in that respect? Well, the, the, first, the first barrier that you've overcome is that you care, that you're paying attention, that you are feeling empathy toward, uh, you know, these children in all of these places. So that's the first thing that, that frankly, you know, many, many adults uh, can't even get to that stage. Um, so that's, that's the first uh, step is to, to, to know what's happening and to understand it and to feel like you want to do things. You know, I often say that you can't necessarily change the world, but you can change somebody's world. You can, uh, whether that might be through donating to an NGO, donating money, donating your time, donating, uh, you know, participating in an appeal, an awareness appeal, um, finding out if there are refugees in your local community, maybe uh, approaching people from uh, the Syrian community, for example, even if they're not refugees, but just people of Syrian heritage or Yemeni heritage or Lebanese heritage, whether that's at the church or the mosque or some other social group, and just letting them know that, that you understand, you care, you sympathize, you empathize. You know, that, that goes a very long way. Um, to, to helping people to cope with things. Uh, and, you know, and that extends to, so you can take it from the, from that level to, to um, you know, being more aware of the news and having a deeper understanding of it. So when it comes to, uh, you know, if you, when you can vote, for example, understanding the issues and, and making um, informed decisions about whose policies you want to support. Because, you know, foreign policy might seem like it's something that's happening out there, over there, it doesn't really affect us. But these policies are being made in your name. Uh, Yemenis know that the British bombs are falling on them. You know, Yemenis understand that the US is backing the Saudis in, in their campaign. Syrians know that it was the Russians and the Iranians who were backing Assad and, and who aided uh, the, the, the rebel side. These are policies that are made in your name, so you have to understand them and you have to be uh, aware of them and you have to either advocate to change them or to keep them. So uh, awareness is, uh, is, is a key element of, of change, I think, and of, and of um, extending and expressing your empathy for people around the world who um, may be marginalized or may be experiencing some of the things like the kids in my book are experiencing. Thank you. That's an excellent answer and I'd heartily endorse that and I think you know in the context of Britain of course our policy towards you know refugees and asylum seekers of how many people that we take in. Uh, David Cameron of course agreed to 20,000 over the period of five years uh, at Lebanon, as uh, Rania said, has taken in a million and Turkey, three and a half million in Jordan, you know, so I think there is a lot that can be, be done in those sorts of areas and um, we're certainly here as Carby to try to help people to, to do that as well. We got a comment from John Kelly. Uh, John, are you with us? Perhaps not. Rania, I wanted to, before we leave, I, you know, uh, you wrote this book and you haven't been back to Syria and been able to go back to Syria, I think, for a couple of years now. But uh, yes. I bet you, um, uh, you know, you're very diligent. You've kept up with the stories of, of, of the families. Um, how, how, how are these sisters faring now? Uh, you know, I finished the book and that's, that's what I was wondering, you know, what's happening to them? Yes, no, I do try and keep... Uh up to date with as many people as I can. It's very difficult to do, you know, I cover a lot of uh, places, not just Syria, and you meet many people. But for people like the families in this book that I've had a long and enduring relationship with, I obviously try and keep in touch with them. The uh, Hanin and her sister Joe are doing okay. They're continuing with their music lessons. Um, they are excelling at school um, and they are uh, still living in their home in Damascus. Uh, Ruha and her sister Ala are refugees in Turkey. They are separated from their father, who remains in Syria. And they are, the family is split between two countries. And uh, it's very difficult, but they are persevering as best they can. 
Well, thank you for that. And we've got another question from Bernie. Uh, yeah, Bernie. Bernie Halley. Hi, just a question. Listening to you, you talk again, it's really, really fascinating and interesting. And I'm loving everything you say. Do you yeah. feel that books that are written both, both for the children and for adults um, about conflict and these issues are best written by someone who's actually either experienced it directly or walked side by side as you have with people in those con conflicts or written by someone at a distance who's researched it really well but hasn't necessarily had a direct contact I, I mean I've I don't know I've, I've just noticed the comment about Elizabeth Baird, um, Laird's book she's a brilliant writer and I think her book Codename Verity was one I read a long time ago. She's she writes for young people and she she writes brilliantly. I don't know if she's been to Syria. I, I haven't seen her or met her in, in recent years, but I just wondered, have, do you have a view on that? Whether you just need to have really been at the heart of it, or do you feel that people appropriate their stories? Because I kind of have avoided writing about refugees altogether, but I'm just finding myself edging into it because there's so many things that really bug me about how refugees are perceived in our country. No, I think there are, there are lots of different books, right? There are lots of different ways to write a book. Uh, there are, you can write a book the way that I did after following people, being on the ground with them, but you can also write a, a, a very thoroughly researched book and you don't have to have necessarily been in a place. I mean, people are writing about, you know, medieval history and they obviously didn't live during that period, but they're relying on other, on other uh, resources. So you can definitely, you don't have to have uh, been in a place, but I think um, uh, what becomes problematic is when you, you want to um, claim that this is the account and, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if you haven't been there, or, or even if you have been there, you know, this idea that, well, this is the account, and this is the truth, and this is what should be happening. No, it is, it is part of it. It is, uh, it is, it is one aspect of it. Um, but you can't, you know, sort of uh, claim this, uh, th this mantle, I don't think. And that's why I, I was saying earlier that I think, you know, the more Syria books, the better, because everyone adds to our understanding of the conflict. I mean, like three people can be at a protest in three different places, and we're going to see three different things. We're going to s speak to different people who might have different ideas, even though they're all at the same protest. So I'd rather read about uh, the, the accounts of all three groups rather than just one group and think that I know what happened at the protest. So, um, you know, there, there are lots of different ways to write a book. And, and when it comes to Syria, the more, the better. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I would also endorse that in terms of Syria because the, the, the war, the conflict, the protests were experienced at different paces, different intensities at different times. Um, you know, some cities have been bombed and rubbleized, some have not, you know, it, 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 there's so many different stories and they were happening in isolation from each other. If you lived in Damascus, you you couldn't get to Aleppo, you know, so absolutely. It, it's absolutely true. Uh, Rania, um, one thing that, you know, you've written these books, you've written as a journalist, but increasingly, I think journalists are finding it harder and harder to, to get into a lot of areas of Syria, including yourself. Um, am I right to, to fear that we could actually be seeing you know, less exposure, less first-hand reporting of what's going on in Syria. Um, and that we need to find ways to open up those sorts of accounts. No, it's a, it's a, it's a real fear, but journalists are only part of that equation. Editors are the other part. Um, so, you know, we can, we can be on the ground or we can say, hey, we need to report on this and we need to, to he here's this story. But it's the editors who are the gatekeepers. And um, they're the ones who will ultimately determine whether something is broadcast or whether something is printed. And you know, they uh, uh, might feel that, oh, well, there's Syria fatigue. And this happens in every long running conflict. We've seen it in Afghanistan, we saw it in Iraq, we've seen it in other uh, places as well, including Yemen. There is this idea that, okay, well, we've already sort of covered that. Yes, but it hasn't stopped, it's continuing, it has morphed, it has now taken on a different form. We need to keep our eye on it because it's important. So, um, you know, we can we can be um, banging on that door all we want. If we want to uh, talk about it and publish it and express it, then what can we do? Indeed. I, I'm reminded of being told by a News at 10, a BBC News at 10 editor once that they all knew this was even back in the 80s and 90s, 
two things that would get people to leave the room and get a cup of tea would be coverage of the Middle East and coverage of Northern Ireland. So I, mean, I think you're absolutely right, editors. We need to convince them. I suppose people can play their role in uh, trying to demonstrate to editors uh, uh, and, and those in charge uh, of media outfits that, yes, there is a market for, for stories about countries like Syria, Yemen, Libya as well, because they do matter. They are important. Um, Rania, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today, to speaking so forcefully and candidly, for having written uh, these books, uh, both of which I think are uh, highly worthwhile. Um, I hope others will add to them as you, as you suggested, but you really did make, a, I think, a really telling contribution to uh, what has been written about Syria, a country that uh, I think before this conflict was very badly understood, but still people, uh, it's difficult to, to catch up and keep abreast of what's going on. There'll always be that challenge. Thank you everybody for your questions. And just to remind you, um, uh, for those who are not CARBU members, uh, please do join, please do sign up. We'll be having further webinars, of course, hopefully in the near future, we may even have real physical me meetings. I suppose that prospect is now on the horizon given the news about vaccines in the last few weeks that we can contemplate that uh, 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 possibility. So do stay safe, everybody. As I said, sign up. Uh, we'll be posting a recording of, of this uh, uh, later on. Once again, Rania, thank you so much for all of this and your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation and thank you very much for your questions.